you've probably been seeing that there is a lot of unrest regarding the definition of the word racism and what we need to do about it. Recently, a Missouri woman contacted the oldest American dictionary, the Merriam-Webster Dictionary, and she requested that they change the definition of racism. Currently, this is the definition of racism. It only talks about the individual cases of racism, Ms. Mitchum complained, and said that it should also include in its definition something regarding institutional racism, things that are not on an individual basis. Today, we're going to be talking about the word racism, its definition, its history, and its origins of use. I'm also going to talk about the dictionary, and by the end, we will have a conclusion about how language changes over the centuries, and who was the first guy who believed that language does change. Wait to the end and you'll find out. I have also included timestamps in the description below if you want to skip a certain part. The word racism, not the concept, is relatively new. The Oxford English Dictionary, which is often used as the authority on things like this, dates its first use to 1902 by Richard Henry Pratt, who also was a bit of a racist himself, but there's the quotation. Segregating any class or race of people apart from the rest of the people kills the progress of the segregated people or makes their growth very slow. Association of races and classes is necessary to destroy racism and classicism. Before this, there were words to describe racism. There was race prejudice, negrophobia, racialism, and race hatred. According to Etymology Online, the first use of racism used to describe American society was in 1928. Here are some original uses of the word racism during the 1920s. The meaning of nationalism in no sense implies any consent to the doctrine of racism, which holds that unity of racial origin is the main principle of unity for civil society and that members of each ethnical branch should properly aim at grouping themselves together into so many national states. Father Lafarge said that the American racism is directed principally against Negroes, Jews, and foreigners. He described it as the pale but venomous cousin of Nazi racism. Like its Nazi counterpart, he added, it has erected impassable barriers between extensive regions and large groups of people. The word racism and racist gained widespread use around 1970, before the word prejudiced or race prejudiced might have been used a bit more. But with racism being used more often in common speech, it also developed its own baggage. Now racism doesn't just mean you don't like someone who looks different than you or you judge someone that looks different than you. But the word racism and racist has developed a connotation that is really kind of the equal of calling someone a Nazi or evil. Linguist John McWhorter also said, it has gone from being mean to someone to also what feels mean to me. It carries much more baggage than that. It's downright evil to be racist. And that might be why it's so difficult to address one's own biases in this area because you're not gonna be racist. That's the worst thing ever. There are two main theories of thought in linguistic theory. One is prescriptivism. That's where you have your grammar police, the people that tell you that irregardless is not a word, that you're using literally too much. And then you have your descriptivist. Most linguists today are descriptivists. They study how people use language and how language evolves over the years. There are rules in language, but it, it changes with the times and definitions change. That's the basic descriptivist theory. You would think that this linguistic relativity is fairly recent. It's a modern invention, but it really isn't. That being said, we tend to look at dictionaries as guardians of the language. Somehow, somewhere, these intelligent people come up with these definitions and it's the Bible of semantic truth. It is a little more complicated than that. Lexicographic Kelly Stamps explains that it is the dictionary publisher's fault that we hold dictionaries as this fountain of knowledge. Originally, it was a prestigious thing to have a dictionary. The first dictionary makers were trying to sell books and they wanted you to think that you had the font of all knowledge if you owned one of these illustrious huge books of the English language. There's this sense that like the Bible, there's something like the dictionary and it has this official status. The thing is, the dictionary is written by people sort of like you and me who just love the English language and they study it and its use. They don't create words and they don't create definitions from scratch. They look at how we, the speakers, use language and they parse out a definition from that. If you're interested in that, there's a book I recommend that I will link in the description. Things get more touchy in a politically charged environment. As early as 2003, Merriam-Webster Dictionary had updated its definition of marriage to include same-sex marriage. When 
people complained about this, they said there was absolutely no political agenda in the dictionary. It was just that the word had been used increasingly in this way, and so marriage was developing a broader definition than the original definition. In 2013, dictionary received a lot of backlash when it included a second definition of the word literally, which included a figurative sense of it. Lexicographer McPherson explained, words have changed their meaning ever since the first word was ever uttered. Meat used to mean all food, but now its sense has narrowed. And in terms of race and people writing to the dictionary requesting for being changed, this is not the first time either. In 2013, hundreds of people signed a petition for the Merriam-Webster dictionary to change their definition of nude to be broader and not just be a definition of color for people of white or pale skin. As the current editor of the Merriam-Webster Dictionary said, most English speakers accept the fact that the language changes over time, but don't accept these changes made in their own time. Noah Webster would have agreed. He too was a linguistic relativist. He had some really strange etymology theories um, that maybe we can get into at another day, but his basic premise was that language changes and it was his job as a dictionary maker to follow these changes and to give the American people a dictionary that reflected the words that they actually used. Now that we've established that dictionaries can indeed change with the times, let's discuss how it's being used today. Does racism refer just to our individual prejudices or can it be used in a broader sense to refer to society at large? We're actually not even asking whether or not you believe that there is systemic racism. We're just asking if people are using the word racism to describe systemic racism in our society. And I think looking at the news today, we can see that people are definitely using the word racism a lot to talk about things more than just personal prejudice. But it has also been used for 50 years in this way. In 1967, political scientists Carmichael and Hamilton talked about systemic racism. After that, there were many other sociologists who referred to systemic and institutional racism. So there have been a lot of cases of the word racism being used, not just on an individual level, but on a macro level. The Merriam-Webster Dictionary replied to Miss Mitchum and said that they would be changing and updating their definition of racism to include systemic racism. They said that the new definition will be expanded to include the term systemic and it will certainly have one or two example sentences. The editor said that the official definition will probably be out in August and they will be working with black study researchers in order to have a better definition of the word. Oh. And about linguistic relativity and how it is definitely not a new thing, here's Horace in the year 18 AD. Many words shall revive which now have fallen off, and many which are now in esteem shall fall off, if it be the will of usage, in whose power is the decision and right and standard of language. We as English speakers form a consensus of what words we will use that express our feelings and opinions. When these words become common usage so that most of the people in the population know what you're saying when you use them, then it's the dictionary's turn to add them. This is why the dictionary does have an extremely important job of being guardians of the language and yet also being up with the times. So what do you think? When do you think a word should be added to the dictionary? How broad of usage should it have. Do you think Merriam-Webster should be updating this definition of racism? Let me know in the comments below. If you learned something from this video, please don't forget to subscribe, like, comment, and share in order to support me and this channel. I will see you next Tuesday.